so let me kick off. Uh, I can I can see it's a small audience for all of us. Uh, so I'll, you know, I guess it can be a round table and an easy discussion for all of us as well. Right. So the context uh, that we had uh, in mind, our mind was to talk through, uh, you know, one of the fundamental uh, outcomes that we look at in the context of uh, undergrad as well as postgrad learning, higher education is employability. Uh, that's a core area that we look at uh, when we work with enterprises, be it with uh, you know a campus or with a university. Uh, one of the core things that we want to achieve mostly is to see uh, how could we increase the employability. Of course, skill is an important dimension that allows for that. Uh, at the same time, it's important to get pedagogy, uh, pedagogy right, and at the same time, various formats of learning that is available. Right. So, uh, so that's the context for today. Uh, so the, we had three things that we thought we could bring in into the picture uh, when we when we imagine the context of employability. So one is, of course, the curricular aspect, right? In terms of as uh, you know, uh, how do we improve the constantly keep changing or improve our curricula so that that is more closely aligned to being job readiness as well as that is most more closely aligned to uh, employability and skills uh, that are in demand. Uh, the second aspect around around this is, of course, the context of faculty, because they are at the core of learning in higher education. So how do we get uh, the faculty to be supported uh, in a way that they can help uh, and improve the learning outcomes, right? So what could we do with the faculty? So that's the second context that we wanted to bring. The third one, of course, is to bridge that gap between the academia and, uh, and the industry in the context of how can we bring uh, that bridges to be much closer so that there is more interaction, there is more uh, two-way process of engagement that allows for better skilling on one side uh, and better knowledge of what needs to be skilled on the other side. Right? So these are the three dimensions that we thought we could um, bring into the context. Uh, now, we, we are aware of uh, you know, the impact that automation and COVID has done. And Raghav spoke about the fact that you know, there were what uh, the the fresh graduate uh, employability is something that has come under stress. And that's not just a COVID-19 phenomenon, it is also in the context of automation, um, where a lot of the entry level jobs that we see today uh, are slowly getting automated and hence there are higher level skills that are in the need for a student to get employed, right? So it's not to say that the jobs have gone away, it's just that the type of jobs have changed at the entry level, right? So that's that's the impact of what automation is doing. Of course, COVID had its impact because COVID accelerated automation in many businesses, and that led to the uh, overall trend that we are seeing, right? Uh, you know, one of the data points that Raghav spoke about in the morning was also about the fact that there were about 145 million new jobs that will be that will be more digital in nature for which we today do not have the right workforce uh, that is available. Uh, similarly, uh, there is a study by NASCOM that came out last year, October, uh, where they talk about a 20X growth in the digital skills that are needed. And then there is an equal amount of gap that, that, that remains in the context of people being ready to pick up those jobs right at the entry level. So that brings us to uh, you know, three things that we are seeing from uh, customers uh, that we work with. Of, uh, you know, one is, of course, the growing trend of blended, uh, blended learning. I know campuses have started to open. Uh, and my own son, who's uh, been in, uh, who's joined college last year, is eagerly awaiting to get back and in, get into the campus. Um, but at the same time, we have, you know, it was, it was very grateful to notice the way, uh, you know, teachers adapted and taught online in a very, you know, in a completely new way uh, that they have brought, many of them had never done previously, right? So there is a growing trend in blended teaching that we think will potentially go forward, uh, will, uh, will be there going forward. Similarly, uh, the second context is, is uh, yeah, so most campuses talking about prioritizing student employability, right? As, as I mentioned, so that's something that is at the core of the discussion today. 
Third, of course, is the improving the affordability uh, and access to higher education uh, uh, so that, you know, irrespective of where the student is or what, where, where he is sitting or which campus he is in, you know, there are many, many universities who have multiple campuses. How could you provide them high quality education, which is affordable? And at the same time, they have the best content and the availability of courses uh, to upskill themselves. The last, of course, is the uh, faculty development, which is, a, which is more like a continuous learning, continuous improvement area uh, for most universities. So these are the four trends that we notice. Uh, maybe I put these numbers here, one, two, three, four, uh, and, you know, depending on your university, if you could check, you could tell us what is, uh, the, what are you seeing in terms of trend right, at your institution? So you can just put these numbers one, two, three, four, uh, or you could, uh, uh, you know, it could it could be one of them, or it could be all four of them. It would be interesting to see that. So, let me cover the first part in the context of curricula and uh, the improvement that is required there with the job readiness. Right now, this is a this is a famous quote uh, quote coming from Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple who talks about the mismatch of uh, mismatch between the skills that are coming out of colleges and that are needed in the future. Uh, there was another panel that I was there uh, almost a month and a half back where uh, I, I actually had a, bu a bunch of university uh, managed uh, leaders. And then on the other side, I had uh, a set of corporate leaders uh, and we were talking about this mismatch of skills. Uh, you know, in a very joking way, one of the one of the panelists who was on the corporate side actually has talked about, you know what, if this doesn't change very soon, corporates will need to start getting into uh, building universities, right, of their own. So, uh, of course, we, we, we see that as a trend, but at the same time, but we, we are also seeing universities transform in many, many of these areas, right? Uh, so if you were to look at the emerging job opportunities that are coming up, uh, in terms of the World Economic Forum data that we see globally, uh, data is number one. AI, ML, no surprise that AI and ML are two top, the top two areas. Uh, the third job uh, specialty, which is high in demand, is big data. Uh, and the fourth one, which has accelerated tremendously, is in, especially in the last uh, 24 months, is the context of digital marketing and strategy specialists, right? So, and then, of course, the automation, as I mentioned, was something that got a huge leg up uh, during the pandemic and hence process automation specialists. These are the five, top five jobs with an increasing demand uh, that we see. And on, on the other side, you see the digital job capacity uh, of this 150 million new jobs that are emerging by 2025, uh, about close to 100 million in software development, about 23 million in cloud and data, 20 million jobs in data analysis, AI ML, uh, 6 million in cybersecurity, and then, of course, privacy and trust and other million jobs, right? So you can see the kind of roles that are, especially digital skill roles that are emerging uh, as the world moves forward. So what we, what we, as we work with uh, uh, the campuses and universities, we typically talk of two areas. One is, of course, career training, uh, which is about creating credentials that are job ready. And the second part is about bringing in curriculum integration that allows for either delivery through a hybrid co uh, you know, uh, courses to be delivered in a hybrid mode where a professor uses a platform like Coursera as a digital bookstore, uh, and then reduces the time and effort in the context of how teaching is delivered, you know, through flipped classrooms uh, and stuff like that. On the other side, of course, uh, with the increasing flexibility that regulators are showing, where you could bring in uh, standalone courses which are of high quality and which of course is vetted by the academic board for a for credit uh, standalone uh, 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 you know course credit that uh, university could offer uh, and these can these can typically take the form of a minor or an honors that could be in the areas of emerging technology or across disciplinary area because that's another aspect that we're starting to see where just you know we're seeing a mechanical engineer wanting to pick up skills in data science and similarly in a liberal arts and English graduate wanting to pick up digital marketing skills, right? So that allows for cross-disciplinary cross disciplinary skills to be enabled uh, in the context of the students and the learners, right? So these are two dimensions that we see. Uh, 
The other aspect that we are bringing together in the context of uh, the topic is to get, okay, one is to get conceptual skills in key, uh, in key high demand areas. The other is to get hands-on skills that allows you to be employable day one, right? And this is where you bring in industry partners uh, like an IBM, a Salesforce, a Facebook, a Google, uh, and so on and so forth, who author courses on their platforms that allows you to uh, integrate ready learning that is, you know, straight away employable in the context of the student, right? They lead to professional certificates and hence demonstrate some form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, proficiency for employers as well, right? Uh, I'll, a simple example uh, here you can see is, for example, in a mechanical design engineer, in a mechanical engineering track, uh, a design engineer could have a, a set of courses which are based on, a, uh, which is an application oriented track based on an Autodex module or a 3D, uh, uh, 3D, 3D motion course that comes from Georgia Tech or uh, a design module coming from, uh, at, uh, you know, the NT, uh, the uh, the NTU of uh, Taiwan, right? Uh, you combine that with the other area, the softer skills of, you know, the communication skills, the human skills and writing, uh, uh, you know, uh, be it in terms of job readiness or be it in terms of employability and taking things forward, right? So, so these are, these, uh, you know, these are, these are two aspects that we are starting to see where, how we could blend these courses that are available on the platform uh, with courses that are run by universities, right? A simple uh, example, this is what we try to do is a, a BTEC in computer science with the, and where we can look at an AI as a specialization here. And if you see here, uh, you have these eight semesters, these are your traditional courses that come as part of curriculum, typically taught uh, in the campus or by the professors from the universities. But what you could also do is you could combine that in for certain subjects with content coming in the second mod, uh, aspect that I spoke about, where you could do a blended learning, where you could bring in a Princeton computer architecture course or a, or a San Diego data, data structure program or a Georgia Tech uh, introduction course to electronics across various semesters, right? So these could get combined in a flipped classroom mode or a digital uh, uh, you know, uh, learning uh, platform and a student undergoes this and the professor could use this for base learning and then be more interactive and get into assessments and proctored uh, assessments uh, run by the professors. Now you can combine that with a few emerging skills uh, in the context of a nano specialization like an AI here. Uh, and that could come from a set of, set of industry and learning partners, uh, university partners like in Michigan, right? So here you have blended courses like an intro to AI from IBM or a major AI applications semester two with, uh, from, uh, from Google or a workflow and uh, project, a hands-on project on an ML uh, from deep learning to AI. Right? So this, uh, you know, and, the, and then in the final semester, you could actually have a hands-on project, AI project that could be delivered on the Coursera project network, uh, which is the kind of project network that we have. And that becomes Ready is the student in the context of a specialization to address the demand for I, uh, the AI roles that I spoke about in the opening uh, session. Right. So uh, at this stage, I just wanted to uh, hear any perspectives uh, from the panelists here along with me. Uh, I'll just stop share so that I can see some of the comments as well and see if there are any inputs that anyone would love to share on this, just in the context of what you're doing there. Um, well, um, I think you made the, uh, several good points. Um, one of the uh, concerns I have is uh, how do we engage the uh, core engineering or uh, areas um, to take advantage of this. This uh, primarily, uh, you know, this is a wonderful platform, but uh, it tries to help uh, people who are in the digital 
um, uh, domain, right? Um, there is digital domains. We have been men mentioning those jobs, uh, you know. Of course, there is a big growth in those areas, no doubt, but it doesn't serve um, uh, all the, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, disciplines, uh, students. Uh, what can we do? That is one, on one hand, I have that question. Um, the, on the other hand, I'm saying there has been sort of a fatigue, right? The students, uh, how do we motivate? That's the largest uh, or most difficult job. I see. Uh, for if 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 somebody is really motivated, they can do wonderful things with uh, these tools, uh, these platforms, uh, even even the YouTube's and many other things, right? I mean, the uh, country uh, they um, they say crores of books available from the IIT system, for example. But who is using them, and how do you keep uh, most of the people? Uh, most of the students, that is, um, you know, motivated to uh, use. What are some learnings for that that comes through, and uh, how how can we inspire people to really uh, make use of this? Because they have to see fundamentally benefits right away, right? I mean, this is a um, gratification, uh, quick gratification <laughs> world these days. So, um, given that, there might be some some techniques that that uh, uh, you know are, are uh, methods that would uh, bear better fruit. Anyway, I, I thought I'd just share some of my concerns. The applicability, one on one hand, broad applicability, um, uh, on the other hand, how do we keep people, um, students primarily, of course, faculty also can benefit from it as well, no doubt. But uh, how do we how do we get them to really use it uh, in a in a more effective way without getting fatigued? So. Sure. Is, is there any 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 uh, example or experience that you could share vis-a-vis -vis how what you have done at your at your university with your students? That will be interesting for us to hear. Anyone uh, would like to share anything? Uh, any experience on this? Uh, I can of course go from from a course. I, I... Yeah. It, I'm sorry, I was mute. I was trying to answer what you were saying. Then I hit the mute button. But I was just saying, I had a little bit of experience uh, at uh, at least two universities in the past. One is at uh, Javier University in uh, Bhubaneswar and uh, UPS uh, as well and uh, Baradun a little bit. Um, so I, I had experimented, uh, you know, um, but it has been a uh, kind of uh, spotty uh, uh, experience. Um, um, uh, people, you know, there, there are students and faculty even who are totally um, driven and some of them would finish like 50 courses <laughs> through the e platform. And right. then there are a, a large majority of people would join, would never finish, uh, get the certificate or whatever that, that thing, the, uh, you know, the end uh, result, they will not achieve. Um, and often, of course, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there were some popular items that were going on fine. But slowly, it felt like the, the interest was waning. I mean, it gets difficult even for us, you know, everything online, standing, you know, sitting in front of a screen is always difficult. But I, I am trying to understand how can we bring that, uh, you know, experiences of education where there is hands-on, uh, uh, you know, activities we are doing, learning in a machine, you know, or some sort of a robot, uh, etc. On one hand, the other is the group activity that was uh, that that uh, brings you know a lot of learning. You know, uh, is there a way to at least mitigate uh, the weaknesses? and bring forward, uh, you know, those aspects. For example, uh, one could work on digitizing electronics, uh, you know, there's a little bit far-fetched, but um, today it seems like, but I'm sure one day we will have where uh, students of electronics and electrical engineering also can learn uh, fundamentally, significantly, um, uh, in in their own domain, their own uh, fields, uh, they, they, you know, um, 
So, so is there some effort going on there uh, on one hand? And the other from uh, my colleagues here, uh, learning how do you get students motivated? See, if we had highly motivated people, no problem. There is sky is the limit. I can totally understand. But I'm talking about average people. That's where really uh, one needs to focus on. Anyway, sure. I'll stop here. I think re really uh, wonderful points from you. Uh, and I'll probably invite uh, Professor Arora to probably share her experience as well. Uh, and I'll summarize with a few few other perspectives that we see uh, in our work with some of the other universities as well. So, uh, Professor Mino, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just joined and I'm not a professor, I'm not a doctor, but yes, I'm an educator. I'm basically a counseling psychologist, just to give you a little background, and uh, worked in the education sector for the last 25 years. Presently, I am working as an assistant director at Priya University, which is situated in Sri City. So, uh, you know, as far as integrating job ready skills in the curriculum is concerned, Priya University, like we follow the interwoven learning model, uh, basically, because, you know, if you, if you look at the future, you know, and in fact, the present situation also, we are living in an interconnected world. Uh, so I have missed the uh, previous conversations. I'm sorry if I am repeating certain things. Uh, but but yes, in this interconnected world, when you know when we uh, I worked as a career counselor for so many years now, and initially I used to guide students that take up one subject and you know study that subject in depth. But but that is not true in today's situation. So when we are talking about the job ready skills, I think first of all. We need to make students aware uh, that we uh, we do require multidisciplinary, in fact, interdisciplinary knowledge. To I like I am a psychologist. Uh, Ninety six, I, I uh, developed a career counseling software with the help of some computer people, right? And in in education sector only, I have changed. Uh, I, I can say uh, not exactly the careers, but yes, my domain of working in various ways. Uh, working from the personal counseling to career counseling to teaching and to now working with the university. So whichever career you look at as an economist, as an engineer, as a computer scientist, you need an interdisciplinary knowledge. And what I see that when students get a degree, they feel that they're ready. And then they start looking for some professional course to be trained even to appear for an interview. So what we do at Kriya University, we, uh, when, when I say interwoven learning model, we have eight main components there. For example, uh, whichever course you are doing, you know, all the courses are very, very research oriented. You know? So even the assessment will be done on your research papers. Uh, we place a lot of emphasis on communication. You know, Many times people say, oh ma'am, I'm doing uh, maths as my major or data sciences as major. Why do I need communication skills? Which is wrong, because if you're not able to interpret data in a context, if you're not able to communicate the data to your organization, you're not needed in that industry, right? So it's very important that, uh, you know, one should know how to uh, communicate orally or in written. Um, then we, uh, you know, our classes happen in such a way where we practice interdisciplinary approach. For example, uh, suppose if you are, uh, we have like, I will just give you one example. We have a professor of literature, uh, Anil Srinivasan. He's a great pianist, right? So while playing piano, he will explain how music is related to maths, to physics. Uh, you know, there is a professor who, who has uh, the interdisciplinary knowledge of anthropology, sociology, history, biology. So, you know, it's, it's very common at our university that uh, on a particular day, a maths professor will not teach you maths, but will teach you ethics. Ethics is another component of interwoven learning. So we have eight components. So ethics, which, you know, uh, which we ignore, we feel that, you know, it comes uh, with the experience. It's not that, you know, you need to train students because we are living in a data-driven world, you know, and, and right now also, if you're attending this session, so many security issues are involved. I was asked to write my email ID at so many places to log into this, this particular session. So it is very, very important. Uh, also, we, we look at the historicity. So when I say historicity, you know, people get confused that it is not history, but it's important to learn how a particular concept has been evolved. I give you a very simple example. You know, I, I always tell students, like if you're working as an economist and, and you know, the other day, in fact, one business person was um, just sharing with me that 
Ma'am, uh, I was just trying to overcome the losses which occurred due to demonetization a few years back. And now because of this lockdown, you know, that, is, that has been multiplied. And now I'm thinking what to do future. So if we just look at this one personal experience, history means what is the learning from the past and how you are going to uh, base your future strategy on the basis of that learning. So, you know, students need these skills, not only uh, job skills, but life skills also. And, and we strongly believe in immersive learning experience. So I see that there is a lot of gap because I worked in the school sector also for 25 years. And what I see, there was a gap between the school sector and the higher ed. So when I joined the university, I tried to build up that gap by bringing out various programs. And now by working with the higher ed, I, I see that there is a lot of gap between the higher ed and the world of work. So, uh, so it's, it's not that after having a BA or BSc degree, the child needs to go for some professional organization to learn how to give an interview. That should be inbuilt. And that's what we do, you know, at CREA also, when students come, they don't need to declare their major minor. So first year is all about core skills and um, these uh, core courses and the core skills, where they learn about mathematical reasoning, data sciences, communication, ethics, design thinking. So I think every university, because one university cannot train the entire community, I think every university should integrate this. I am sorry if I've taken so much of time. Sure. I'm so passionate about this topic because at a personal level, also as a psychologist, also, you know, I get thousands of cases, you know, where students feel so underconfident that I have a degree, what is my ROI for a course with a university? And I, I always ask them, what do you mean by ROI in terms of happiness or money? So I think career or job skills is much beyond what we actually see. Sure. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor. A wonderful perspective. And I'm going to use this word interwoven learning in some of my other talks. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, maybe I, there was a comment from Professor Kalyani Samantre on uh, how they are doing it. And it spoke, his, uh, Professor spoke about how they are leveraging assessments as one of the ways. So here are a few things that uh, we have noticed. Uh, I think one is, of course, uh, in an online digital learning platform, especially when uh, and when you talk of job ready skills, one of the core things is to have an assessment that allows for skills to be built. Right. So, one is to have an assessment which which allows you to pass an exam or get a credit. Other is for you to figure out what skills have you developed. So, one of the one of the things that the platform that we today have allows for a student to see is that. Oh, I have studied this, or I have done this course, or I have done this as a submission. And by doing so, here are the skills that I'm developing. Now that skills taxonomy is exactly the same thing that an employer looks for, right? So a course or a content or an assessment or your work is translated back into a certain set of skills. We call it skill sets. That's the term that we use. So people, individuals can see where they are. So if I have something as simple as I'm a, I have an aspiration to be a developer and I want to be on the mobile developer side, or I want to be a data scientist, but I, of course, and that's my career path that I want to choose. So what the platform does is that it tells you where you are. These are the core skills that you're required to do there. And based on the courses that you've taken, here is the level of skills that you're developed. And here is what you, here are the few other courses that you could do to move from uh, let's say the required level is 60, you are at 40 in order to cover these 20. Here are the courses and the chapters if you which you cover, which will develop those skill gaps and hence and you know enhance your ability to move forward. So we combine uh, the ability of assessments, the courses, and translate that back into skill sets. So that's something that we've announced very recently on the platform, which we are seeing great traction with students. The other one, of course, um, you know, uh, Professor spoke about the context of gratification, right? I think uh, that is in the new generation. I think they love it. So one of the aspects of, especially in the Coursera platform, is the fact that when you complete a course, you get a you get a certificate which comes from one of the top universities. So it's or from us, or you can actually go deep in a specialization. I have deep interest in a specialization, so I could actually not just complete one course but actually go deeper and complete a specialization and get a certificate which says, you know what, I'm a specialist in data science or I'm a specialist in digital marketing, so on and so forth. 
So those are some aspects that we see. Uh, the other aspect, uh, this is in the context of engagement, uh, is the aspect of hands-on learning, right? Uh, video learning with quizzes, assessments is one way of engaging. And, and you know, obviously they're all short form content. It's not one lecture of 60 minutes. They're broken down into 10 minutes, six minutes each, uh, followed by assessments, followed by submissions, followed by uh, peer assessments, discussion groups where uh, peer learners can exchange ideas. So that's one on the digital platform. The other is to take that and go back and put it hands on and to learn if you know if i'm learning python i can actually go and see have a tutored hands on lab where i'm doing my work making my submissions so that's the other aspect that we see uh, is and it helps us keep the students to be engaged and then as they do that we can tell them you know what your skill mastery in this area is just about 10 you know another 6 hours away from a, a level uh, to a skill mastery of an expert or level to a skill mastery that will allow you to get a job. Right? So those, those are some aspects that we are seeing. So I wanted, I know, uh, I wanted to bring the second part of the discussion. Um, if I may just share my screen here. So the second dimension that I was speaking of for today was how can we support faculty uh, in the context of improving the learning outcomes. So faculty development is an important area that as we speak with most uh, uh, universities, we realize that's something that's becoming central to many many of the uh, learning outcomes that people want to, to, uh, to impact. Uh, so for example, we, you know, we've, we, these are some of the courses that we saw, uh, you know, what the employers are seeking. Right, which is cybersecurity, AML, deep learning, and you know, when I spoke in the earlier session. Now, we also find that one of the core areas we find is challenges that universities talk about is that their inability to get good instructors in these areas. Right? Uh, so these, this comes in as a key challenge. Right. So how do you uh, enable uh, a faculty to get learning? What do you, how do you give them the platform where they can learn and so that they can impact the ability of a student to learn. So these are, these are some of the trends, trending topics that we have seen uh, with faculty learning on our platform. If you see here on the business skills, uh, you know uh, something as simple as spreadsheets, uh, oral communication, project management, blockchain, design thinking. On the technology side, you can see here IoT gamification, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and similarly on the data science. So, and you can see the top courses that they were done. The Stanford course in machine learning was a top course uh, that was uh, leveraged by faculty. Uh, in these times, one of the areas was of course, well-being, uh, not just to the faculty and because a lot of the faculty were also in many ways mentoring, coaching students to cope with these times, right? So the, con so the, so the uh, course from Yale on well-being was very, greatly leveraged by faculty here and so on and so forth. There are 10 courses here, uh, and we'll share these uh, with each one of you. So the question that I wanted to get into the second part is if any of you could share your experiences and what are you investing in faculty development uh, for job ready skills? Any perspectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis faculty development? Or is this is this an area? Yes, please, ma yes, please, Professor. No, I'm just thinking loudly uh, as as you have posed this question. So I think um, faculty, of course, uh, the professional development program is extremely important, and you know, many a times we feel that uh, just going through the latest researches is more than enough. But I think every discipline, every professor you know, needs to uh, be supported maybe through Coursera courses, you know, where uh, the, the way I was talking about the interconnected world, you know, that that how, what are the various concepts which are related to that particular discipline? So suppose if I'm a biology professor or I'm a psychology professor, you know, how, how it is integrated or how it is weaved into data sciences, what is AI? Because I tell you my experience as, as a psychologist when I started working in 96, I joined an 
organization where uh, they told me that you know that you develop a career counseling software and i said no i'm sorry i'm a psychologist i cannot develop and this is how they forced me and you know uh, i i said okay i have to develop otherwise i will lose my job <laughs> so so you know i developed in 96 so you know the you know the professor in in the class you know it, it is not that career service or career counseling is given by a separate department as a professor of any discipline i should be able to equip my students you know uh, that that have to survive in that particular industry because even the conventional careers need to be uh, pursued in an un- in an unconventional way and and for that as a professor where do i get a support so either industry leaders come and talk to me uh, if i'm connected with the industry leaders i know what is in demand because like at kriya we keep calling these industry leaders and when um, microsoft research uh, CEO, he came and you know Google Research CEO also of India. They came and they said that we are looking for undergrads who have liberal arts degree. And you know IBM, IBM has taken two of our students in a for a project uh, who have history, who are history undergrad. You know, so you know that was very amazing for me. That why have you taken history students? They said no, we it's not history as history. These are the skills which come with that subject. You know that how to present the factual information. in in the most interesting way how to connect various dots so i think uh, in every discipline if we can give these kind of courses which are uh, easily available to professors that would be really good yes uh, i think maybe that's that in any other perspectives i'll just probably uh, professor patra uh, okay uh, there is a suggestion that professor patra has put which says can the coursera courses include a teachers handbook something available to faculty leveraging a course. yeah i think that's a great idea um in the context of when when a teacher is teaching a course there could be a teacher's handbook uh, thank you thank you professor patra that's an interesting suggestion the other one uh, from professor urmila is talking about faculty needing hands on training for his domain in collaboration with industry yes a uh, great point absolutely um so i'll come to one additional perspective and then we'll see if there is a if there is anything else to bring here um and this is a, you know the context of industry partnership right uh, what are the opportunities for academia and industry to collaborate um now we know that hiring companies have become more cost conscious so they want people to be more ready uh, in the context of skills so that's something that we we see where companies are demanding skills versus degrees or versus what they have completed or you know what subjects they've studied right they want to know what skills the students have traditionally we have seen uh, that a lot of the co- institutions are partnering with companies like IBM and AWS and Googles of the world uh, and that's a great approach uh, where these academic centers of excellence along with industry centers of excellence they come together and these courses are made available to university students and to faculty to uh, you know to learn from uh, but what we what we also see is that as a result of these they tend to become very tool specific or very specific to a particular company's outcome right uh, versus from a student's perspective you may want them to be ready and be knowledgeable of a skill in a much broader perspective you know, the idea being that let them let's not restrict them to learn data science which comes only f- which comes with the view of how ibm defines data science but they should understand data science in the context of how it is how it will be relevant to a lot more companies uh, from a conceptual perspective right so right. so these are two things that we see as uh, you know issues that come up um the other aspect of course is Uh, uh, you know the constant demand uh, from the universities in wanting to know what is the in demand skills uh, from employers right what should we focus on so that when our students pass out they have the relevant skills that can make them uh, uh, you know employable so the visibility that comes you know especially when uh, given we have employers training their people and looking at courses that allows them to keep their workforce uh, ready for the work that they do and similarly we also know that that also gives us a visibility in terms of which industry or which segment or which company has what demand for skills right so there is a visibility that the platform uh, always creates so that visibility is something that we 
you know, uh, give it back to the university so that they can constantly tailor uh, their curriculum and their students to be directed to take the right credentials, right? Of course, a platform also allows us to connect the faculty and students to the relevant programs on account of that. And at the same time, provide all of this in the context of it being cost effective, because one of the things that we realize is that it becomes very difficult to have a lot of industry partnerships. So what we have done is that at the platform is that we have about 70 odd companies, uh, you can see a set of the logos out here, who actually have put their content and their professional certificates on the platform. So that allows you to get a much wider gamut of industry ready, industry accepted professional certificates that allows for your students to be uh, more ready in the context of employment without having to invest in multiple industry partnerships, right? So these are these are uh, courses and content that are authored by these companies. They're not third party people who do that. So it comes from them and some great content and some of the great certificates that are ready to be employed. For example, a Google support engineer or a, in the sales and marketing side, a professional certificate on a business development rep or a sales development rep or on sales operation, right? These are some ready certificates that are available from these companies uh, that allows you to get employed. A Facebook certificate on digital marketing, right? And, and an IPIP certificate on uh, uh, data science, right? So just wanted to bring that uh, into the context of some of the patterns that we are observing. Uh, anything that you, any of you would like to share your points of view in building a sustainable partnership of this nature between academia and the industry that that would be good for the future of the students. Um, uh, I said the one part, um, there should be a concept um, like uh, internships for faculty members also in the uh, industry, uh, where perhaps for a month or at least a couple of weeks, uh, they can spend uh, time in an industry and uh, really get engaged uh, for a couple of reasons, not only to understand what's the, um, what are the needs and the gaps uh, or, or needs, but primarily skill needs of the industry, uh, but also um, for establishing the rapport relationship that it is truly uh, for any country such as in India, where the academy, uh, academic and uh, industry relationships are not great or are not strong by that I mean. Um, uh, that, that needs to be remedied. Without that, we'll be pointing fingers at each other, saying that, okay, they are not, <laughs> the students are not industry ready and we'll say that the industry is too narrow and uh, not uh, supporting the academia to, to deliver. Um, so that that has to be addressed in certain ways, and uh, I hope <laughs> some of you have some bright ideas how to go about this. No, I think that's that's a great point on uh, faculty internships. I think in addition to the point that you made earlier on uh, instructors' handbook, right? So thank you, thank you, Professor Patra. Uh, wonderful inputs. Uh, any anyone else has a perspective in terms of industry? I can see. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to uh, share something which we practice uh, at our sure. university also. Uh, we can have capstone thesis. So uh, like uh, at our university, the third year students are involved with the capstone thesis where they work on a real industry problem under the mentorship of a professor. So, you know, that gives them a, a very uh, first-hand information. And it's not that a thesis, like it has credits also. So that is required in order to get a degree. Uh, and also, like uh, uh, Professor Priyadarshan was mentioning about internship for professors, which is very, very interesting. Uh, we also give internships to students. So, you know, like I was sharing that in the first year, our students uh, study the core courses and the skill courses. So whatever skills they have learned, they practice at the end of the first year by involving themselves in the internship. That when they declare their major minor in the second year, then between second year and third year, we again involve them in some industry internship. And, you know, that is amazing because what I have seen, like I give you a very, uh, one example, one student said, 
I want to do pursue psychology, and he was hell bound for psychology. And when he went uh, in the first year for psychology internship, and when he was supposed to work with the children, he said, "No, no, no, this is not me. I want to study psychology, but I don't want to be with children." So now, towards the end, he declared his majors as politics plus psychology, right? So, which is a very interesting combination. So, these internships are very, very important. One, two. know that what you are actually passionate about to know the real world of work and secondly sometimes to narrow down your choices sometimes also to decide what you don't want to do so uh, that's extremely important and i see uh, i see it as simple as that you know that if you want to learn swimming you have to reach the swimming pool you cannot learn it in a classroom situation so uh, yes thank you sure thank you i, I think uh, in, interestingly because given as i mentioned earlier that we have businesses leveraging our platform to upskill reskill we have universities leveraging us to teach uh, what uh, we see one of the when we go to corporates one of the core things that they talk about is industry ready skills and hiring as a platform if we could help them as an outcome uh, whereas when we talk to universities employability is the outcome that we see right a few experiments and pilots that we are running uh, i'm sharing the in you know in confidence to this team out here uh, a few things is one example is of a skill set right as i said uh, there are roles that corporates are now saying okay you know what these are my when an accenture comes and talks to us he says you know what when i go to a campus these are my five top roles that i want to hire for and if i want to hire for them he, these are the five skill sets under under those roles that are important for me when i look at as a single student whether they are ready to be hired by me as a company right so we so we actually give visibility to the university and the student saying that you know what this uh, uh skill set is actually sponsored by these companies right so you know that when i study that course automatically i will come in the radar of a potential employer who's looking for those skills and it is going to help me improve those skill sets so again the idea is to bring the ability of a platform to bring transparency visibility and bring that collaboration apart from of course bringing the industry content and certificates that allows for people to get employed right so uh, i think the faculty engagement uh, in the industry is is an inter- very interesting uh, you know interesting example that uh, professor umila has spoken about here uh, so that can obviously bring along with the faculty obviously a lot of students can also come through right so that is impactful so i think uh, i know we are at about 5 minutes ahead of uh, the schedule at this stage i'll pause and see if there are any general observations any other points beyond these three that anyone would like to make and then i could quickly summarize um actually i didn't want to add anything at this point but i wanted to kind of understand a little bit uh, what you're thinking on um, uh, the issue of uh, you know some of the courses becoming very narrow specific to a particular company or uh, industry what what's being done about it yeah so so we are not narrowing a course to a company uh, what we are saying is the other way around the courses still mm-hmm. are from universities and industry com- industry partners uh oh sorry let me just actually understand you better because i'm okay let me maybe i should clarify a little bit sometimes we have you know let's say a course in ai intro to ai or even a series of courses that are interconnected with each other uh, offered by let's say ibm or intel uh, or microsoft etc uh they tend to focus on some more than the others focus on their specific uh, tools and methods right Thanks. so a student cannot be expected to do many multiple courses obviously like i said they have been fatigue and lack of time so many other uh, things are there so how do we make these things relevant while keeping you know uh, the core or the uh, the foundations general enough that can they can stand on themselves and take on anything for the matter in the future while establishing themselves as 
is so called inductive ready yeah if you want to hire they want to see that their tool is <laughs> what the student knows who, I, how do you draw that balance and yeah that's that's what my curiosity is about no, I, i think I, I, as i mentioned earlier as well i think this is this is a great great question and and that's exactly what we tell when we speak to uh, in our engagements and uh, with many of the universities is to combine this with university authored content which is never specific to a company as as you mentioned right if 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 uh, ups is going to teach ai i'm very sure it is not going to teach ai the way ibm wants to teach it it will teach ai the way you would want it to be more conceptual that prepares the student for to take on anything right, the way you mentioned so so that's that's the uh, context of trying to bring a university content in in the space along with uh, and if I, if i as an a student want to i have an aspiration to be in google let i'll pick up the google specialization right in ai but in order to get my base ai and ml uh, uh you know learning i'll go to a university of michigan content or i'll probably pick up a princeton content i'll do the uh hands on project which comes from uh the coursera project network and then i will specialize myself in a you know an ibm content or a google content more specifically right so depending on my aspirations so this is one of the ways that we have seen university bring where they bring the conceptual skills back into uh the focus and then then bring the industry uh specific tool specific i call that more tool specific skills which allows for employability as well thank you so uh so so with this about a minute to go uh, let me just quickly summarize i think uh, uh, we covered three aspects uh one is of course the context of where the skills are what the skills are and the need for curricula to be constantly uh, in line with where the industry is demanding its uh, uh, talent to be needed so that's something that we see uh, we are seeing various approaches from universities in terms of trying to blend the curriculum uh, with core content from their own faculty additional content from other out- other universities and then of course bringing in industry content right so that's one aspect the second one we i think an interesting discussions on the faculty development uh, some great suggestions on bringing faculty internships uh, that was that was uh, really wonderful for us to take also the context that we heard from uh, heard on the uh, faculty and instructors note or a faculty's note that is available so that the teaching can be more effective so that was the second and of course the third one uh, we spoke about the industry academy uh, engagements where that there is a need for core foundational skills that comes uh, along with the need for a company specific or a tool specific uh, skill to be combined that makes students to be more employable so uh, thank you everyone for joining us it was wonderful to hear your perspectives and uh, especially uh, thank you uh, to all the uh, my professor colleagues out here uh, wonderful to always interact with you thank you so much thank you <laughs> i just asked a question maybe offline you can uh, take it on and uh, share a uh, uh, little bit Sorry, of information with us thank you mr do you mind sharing a summary of the needs from your industry partners uh so i think as i mentioned i think one is of course we see there is one in the context of what they want where they see demand right we do see a lot right. of demand in data science ai and business skills these are the three uh, areas in the business skills i think they want people to be more ready uh, like uh, you know uh, we had uh, minu talk about communication skills soft skills right so there are many aspects mm-hmm. of that. they are they are wanting to uh, a student to come out with a set of core hard skills and a core of soft skills we call them human skills and um, technology skills right so that's a combination mm-hmm. we're starting to see Uh, that's what we see from the industry that they demand of course they there is always a variability of uh, a tech area uh, especially the technology hiring but one of the other aspects which uh, you know meenu spoke about and that's something that we are starting to see a trend uh, other day i was speaking to a large it services company global and there is an entire batch of students who are not from technology 
they're actually commerce students, history students that they have hired and brought them to do potentially digital tech, digital work. And they and and they said that, you know what, for them, the, and they were talking to us in the context of helping them prepare with a set of you know, prepackaged courses so that those students could be much better prepared before they join. They didn't want them to be lost day one coming into the company. They said, okay, can we get this, can they, can we get them some foundational courses that, so that they are prepared as they come into this new journey? The students are extremely excited about a new potential new career path that earlier they didn't imagine, but as they were traversing through the career, they realized that could be an opportunity because now companies are more open to looking at these skills. So that's that's another trend that we're starting to see. Uh, I know I, I work for IBM uh, and we of course moved away from looking at degrees as a necessary requirement. It's not that we would not want a person to have a degree, but it would also say that, but I would want a person to have a set of skills. Um, when we started our first design practice, we went and hired sociologists and we said, we said, okay, you know what, until you understand behavior, your, your design is never going to be impactful. So we hired a bunch of sociologists. Uh, we used to also talk about that we had the biggest math lab in the world, the, num the number of PhD in mathematics that we used to have because because uh, that formed the basis for data. Data and technology is very simple, but this, if you don't understand math underneath it, algorithms underneath it, it's not an easy one to do. So, so yes, I think I, I feel interdisciplinary learning is something that we're starting to see pick up uh, heavily in the way they are wanting to hire as well. Uh, thank you everyone once again. I'll see you all at the closing session in about uh, 15 minutes. Wonderful thank to you. have you all.